The particular form that the human mind takes is a result of the parsimonious processes of evolution and its demand for contingent solutions to immediate problems. And the immediate problems which shaped our bodies and minds for all those millennia whilst we were grown up in Africa were problems of survival and reproduction, or of navigating environments. Our adaptive history has not prepared us for conceptual engagement with quarks or neutron stars or for the furthest reaches of quantum mechanics, nor are we constitutionally prepared or sensorially equipped to confront the abstractions of philosophy, religion and the social sciences. The mystery, therefore, is that despite these evident limitations, we do indeed engage with such abstractions to a remarkable degree and with an equally remarkable degree of success. The question is, therefore, as Stephen Pinker puts it in The Stuff of Thought, how does a mind that evolved to think about rocks and plants and enemies think about love and physics and democracy? Now, according to theory, which is sometimes called cognitive metaphor theory, sometimes called conceptual metaphor theory, the dominant strategy for this, abs for this uh, apprehension of abstract concepts is through the widespread and largely unconscious application of metaphor, such that we understand these abstract concepts in terms of more concrete concepts. And what I hope to show is that metaphor usage is ubiquitous in everyday speech, present in most of the sentences we utter, and yet for the most part goes completely unnoticed. Some theorists put the percentage of um, spoken language as metaphorical at about 90%. So even though it appears very clear and translucent most of the time and, and plain, all speech is um, riddled with metaphor. An expression is only apprehended consciously as a metaphor when it is particularly flowery, the so-called literary metaphor. But it's important to keep in mind, though, that in this emerging field of cognitive metaphor theory and in cognate domains of knowledge like experiential realism, cognitive linguistics particularly, metaphors are not additional to plain language, used only to, to clothe and communicate difficult ideas, but rather are the substance of ideas and of thought itself. As Tim Rohrer puts it, metaphors are a matter of cognition and conceptual structure rather than a matter of mere language. The biologist and linguist Steven Pinker, who I mentioned a minute ago, traces the origins of metaphor use to an adaptation of existing cognitive mechanisms originally designed to allow the body to sense and negotiate its environment. In other words, the sensory motor systems that I've spoken about before, sensory motor systems which allow for the construction of representations within cognition. As Pinker describes it, the structures of cognition which, in early humans as in other animals, originally evolved to deal with the problems of moving through a physical, spatial environment, sensing objects and movements, experiencing force and resistance. At some point, these structures were copied into other parts of the brain, such, they be such that they became, as he says, scaffolding, whose slots are filled with symbols for more abstract concerns like states, possessions, ideas and desires. So it's almost like this: um, these cognitive representations, possibly action representations, some kind of sensory motor uh, representative process going on within cognition, those structures are repurposed, divested of their literal content and uh, allowed to to form and give structure to what would otherwise be completely evanescent abstract concepts like democracy and love and those kind of things that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, okay, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson identify a second mechanism by which the cognitive scaffolding proposed by Pinker becomes populated with metaphorical associations. And here they give a kind of um, developmental narrative, a kind of examples of what kind of things would have to happen in order for that process to take place. They claim that in early childhood, terms from the concrete source domain of lived experience, the stuff that is available to the senses, uh, are fused with terms from the abstract target domain through their repeated coincident occurrence. So, for example, the experience of seeing the level of a liquid in a container go up as more liquid is added leads to the association of more 
with up. More is an abstract concept, up is a, is a, a completely visual experience and sensory experience, sensory and motor experience. So more and up are fired together and wired together. The association then becomes available as a metaphor to express the sense that some other I beg your pardon, to express the sense that some otherwise abstract concept is increasing or decreasing. Because sometimes we want to say that the um, that the quantity of something is increasing, but it's it's an abstract concept. So Lakoff and Jens Johnson cite expressions such as prices rose, his income went down. Now the prices aren't really going up, income isn't really going down, but we understand that there's that moreness is being alluded to. Employ unemployment is up, exports are down, the number of homeless people is very high. These are uh, uses of the more is up metaphor. Uh, working with the same metaphor, uh, Kovex cites the examples of sound intensity, which again is often identified as being high in volume. When there's more sound, we say it's high. And this can be reduced by turning the sound down so it feels literal, but it's not literal, it's a metaphor. Allied, or I should just say that allied to this use of up as a metaphor for more is an, an, an elaboration in which up is also a metaphor for good. So up is good. And I'm not going to go into that now, but that is something I'm going to talk about later. So I just wanted to signal that. Uh, they call that process whereby abstract and uh, concrete concepts are united in this metaphorical way, conflation. The, those ideas are conflated together. Uh, an important example of this conflation is that which is argued as linking the concrete experience of seeing with the abstract concept of knowing. This metaphorical link is developed by Christopher Johnson, by Joseph Grady and by Lakoff and Johnson, and is claimed to be forged through the recurrent experience in which one comes to see something at the same time as one comes to know that thing. So as you approach an object in the real world, for example, you, uh, you see it, and, as the, and the closer you, your seeing becomes to it, as you move in towards this object, and your seeing becomes more closely engaged with it, so your um, knowledge of this, your acquaintanceship with it, your, uh, your uh, ownership of it, your uh, ability to contain and describe and interact with it increases. So seeing and knowing tend to coincide. And again, that's a conflation. And that's a particularly important one, which I'll be dealing with later, this idea of seeing and knowing. And of course, that crops up in, in, in routine speech all the time. Quite often when we want to, to say that we know what a person means, we say, I see what you mean. Uh, I'll be talking about that as well later on. OK, so the conclusion to these various theories and developments is an understanding of the key role that metaphor plays in language and cognition. And although I'm talking about metaphor right now, I'm understanding metaphor as one of a series of um, tropes, pieces of fig figurative language, which exist within overall poetics, what I'm calling a poetics, a set of um, devices, if you like, which allow cognition to take place and thought to take place, poetic devices. So this is what uh, Lakoff and Johnson, uh, what Lakoff and Johnson say about this. Metaphor is for most people a device of the poetic imagination and the rhetorical flourish, a matter of extraordinary rather than ordinary language. Moreover, metaphor is typically viewed as characteristic of language alone, a matter of words rather than thought or action. For this reason, most people think they can get along perfectly well without metaphor. We have found, they say, on the contrary, that metaphor is pervasive in everyday life, not just in language, but in thought and action. Our ordinary conceptual system, in terms of which we both think and act, is fundamentally metaphorical in nature. Fundamentally metaphorical, or I would say fundamentally poetic. Okay, that's where I'm going to leave it today, but... Um, what I want to try to move into next is to try to give some examples of some of these metaphors in action, just so we can really find our way around that. And then I want to start talking about uh, metaphors of thought more broadly, and then breaking it down into metaphors of different kinds of thought, including that kind of thought that we call knowledge or knowing, 
And what I want to try to demonstrate when we get to that point is that these things aren't discontinuous and just kind of random uh, flights of poetic fancy, but there is actually quite a strongly inter integrated, consilient, coherent system of metaphors, a kind of imaginary world that we walk around in when we're doing this, these different forms of thinking. And we talk about different forms of thinking and gesture about different forms of thinking and write about different forms of thinking in different but coherent ways. Okay, thanks very much for watching.